tabernacle is arguing with God. Exodus 4, verse 10. And Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore nor since thou hast spoken unto thy ser servant. Really? It sounds pretty eloquent to me. Heretofore? Uh, uh, but he says he's not. Now, we know he was because he was learned in all the ways of the Egyptians. So if there was a school he went to it, his mama made sure that you know, her boy was going to sit on the throne and be, you know, head and shoulders above the rest of them. So he had all the learning, but it wasn't a problem of learning. It was a problem of will. He says, But I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. Well, he must have been a southerner. Nothing wrong with talking slow. Verse 11. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? Or who maketh the dumb, or deaf, or seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. And he said, O my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of whom thou wilt send. The inference here is, go pick somebody else, and I don't care who it is, I'll support you. <laughs> he said, no, I've already made my choice. Verse 14. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well, and also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee, and when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. And thou shalt speak unto him, and put words in his mouth, and I will be with thy mouth and with his mouth, and will teach thee what, you sh what ye shall do. Hmm. That's the story we've got. What we see here is Moses is in an argument with God. That's not a good place to be. But guess what? We're there all the time. God will say something to us, and we've got another idea. <laughs> we think we know best. Surely he couldn't have meant what I just heard. Yes. <laughs> I know I read that, but it can't apply to me. Let's, let's put that in a different dispensation. <laughs> no, God's very pointed. Proverbs 13, Proverbs 13, verse 10. Proverbs 13, verse 10. I hate to start preaching from verse one of the sermon on but we're going to <laughs> proverbs 13 verse 10 the problem with arguing with god boils down to one reason proverbs 13 10 only by pride cometh contention but with the well advised is wisdom god's advising moses moses has got a contention with god therefore moses is proud even though the argument he's giving seems to be a humble argument woe is me i'm not good enough god says no that's pride when i tell you to do something you say i can't that's pride mm. what the bible says mm. well notice in our text in verse uh, chapter 3 verse 8 first thing i'll see is i call authority authority exodus 3 verse 8 we're going to back up and get the context for the story we read. Exodus 3, verse 8. God speaks here. If you ever heard God speak, well, it's on the page, so you just read it and you'll hear it. <laughs> when you hear Him speak, it's authoritative. You want to know the difference? Pick up a modern version. An NIV, the, the message, uh, ESV. It sounds like a little uh, two-year-old talking. It does not sound like God talking. God speaks with authority. Exodus 3, verse 8, God says, I am. Now, that's how he introduces himself as the I am. He says, I am come down to deliver. Let's get on board with that one. God says, I'm going to do some delivering. That's who he is, the I am. Look verse 10. I'm just jumping through there so I don't read you all of these verses. You can go home and read them. In verse 10, he says, I will send. There's something God's doing. He didn't ask anybody's opinion on it. <laughs> verse 12, he says, Certainly I will be with thee. Good news. I'm coming down. I'm going with you. We're delivering. Verse 14. 
And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. God's giving instruction here. He's not asking for advice. He's not carrying on a conversation. He, when you read the Bible, it does not ask you for your opinion. That's authority. That's God. Look at verse 18. Exodus 3, 18. And they shall hearken to thy voice. Is there any argument about that? Should not be. God says, I'm sending you down there. I'm going to give you the message. You're going to go preach this message. They will hear it. Why would you argue with that? But he's going to. Now, where he's talking about here is this. I'm sending you to your brethren to convince the brethren it's time to depart Egypt. That's who's going to believe it. Now, of course, we know Pharaoh's not going to. And God's not telling him Pharaoh's going to believe it. But he's telling him his brethren will. Go down there and they'll listen to you. In the face of God's authority, take heed. Beware the danger when his words you misread. For arguing against his divine decree leads to paths of folly fraught with plea. His wisdom surpasses all we conceive. In his presence, humble hearts should believe. To, uh, to challenge his will, a perilous quest. In his might, no mortal can contest. His love is boundless, his justice true, yet daring to argue, we may misconstrue. For in our fault, we fail to see. Power and authority belong only to he. Trusting God's wisdom and let ego subside, in humble surrender, his command abide. For in the danger of arguing, we see our passion in opposition to the man of war's decree. If we really realized who God was, we wouldn't argue with him. He's all-powerful. Now, he's just showed up to Moses. Moses has done these miracles. Could you imagine your hand turning to leprosy and then being healed? Your, your uh, staff turned into a snake? And then that one says, go do this, and you say, I don't think you know what you're talking about. <laughs> don't argue. <laughs> That's not the right one to argue with. The next thing I'll notice in our passage I call inferiority. Look at it in ver uh, chapter 3, verse 11. Moses gives a response. Inferiority. Chapter 3, verse 11. And Moses said unto God, Who am I? You notice, he just told off on himself. God showed up and God said, I am. Moses says, Am I? <laughs> Moses is just the opposite. He says, Who am I? Who cares? <laughs> God didn't ask, What's your opinion of yourself? <laughs> he gave him a task to do. Where did ego show up in this thing? God didn't say, I'm looking for the most popular man I can find. Mm -hmm. Moses, do you think you qualify? No, he didn't ask that. He just said, get going. <laughs> Look at verse 13. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you. And they shall say unto me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? Hmm. Moses says, I know you just told me they're going to hear me and they're going to hearken and all this stuff, but i got a question to you. What if they don't? You know, isn't that normal? When we see something God says or tells us to do, we always have the question, what if? <laughs> what if ain't part of it? He is. Exodus 4, look at verse 1. <coughs> Moses has heard God speaking a lot. And so now he thinks, it's my turn to talk a lot. The more we talk, the more trouble we get in. Exodus 4, verse 1. And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice. That's exactly what God said they would do. They would hearken to him. Now he's called God a liar. He didn't realize he was doing that. And he wasn't intentionally calling God a liar, but he sure was, because God said just the opposite. He says, 
for they will say, now he's making stuff up, <laughs> the Lord has not appeared unto thee. He's just imagining. So what does God do from here on? From here on, God says, okay, no more talking from me. You've heard my voice and you're not listening. I'll engineer some things so you suddenly see who I am. That's where all of these miracles come in. Throw the stick down, turns into a serpent. Put your hand in, there's leprosy. Get the cup of water, dump it out, that's blood. All of these great things. No more oratory from God is given, only object blessings. Failure to believe simple instructions lead to more drastic measures. <laughs> that's us. We fail many times just to follow and believe the simple instructions found on the page. So life shows up with bigger problems. <laughs> now, it's not that God's not going to overcome the problems. He's going to teach you to go back and listen to the one little simple thing he said from the beginning. <laughs> now, Moses' argument. It's a phony argument, but he uses it. He says, I'm not eloquent. Nowhere in there did God say, I'm looking for eloquence. <laughs> but he says, you know, if I were man, I would only listen to someone who is eloquent. Now that's nice. Wouldn't you and I like to hear somebody eloquent? It ain't me, but somebody. <laughs> that's a good, we enjoy that. That's good entertainment. It is a blessing from God to be able to speak correctly and nicely and put your words together in a, in a nice fashion. However, it's not necessary. Let's find it in the Bible. Isaiah 3. Isaiah 3, verse 2. Isaiah 3, 2. He says, The mighty man and the man of war. Okay, these are great things. He's giving you a list of greats here. The mighty man, the man of war, the judge, and the prophet, and the prudent, and the ancient. The captain of fifty, and the honorable man, and the counselor, the cunning artificer, the eloquent orator, and I will give children to be their princes, and babes shall rule over them. Hmm. This is the curses of God on the nation of Israel as he's taking these things away from the nation. You know, the very last thing in the list of greats, an eloquent orator. <laughs> So it must not be quite as important as we make it, <laughs> but we do make it pretty important. God says, no, I'm taking all those away. Now, you know why God wasn't in, interested in oratory and great speech ability? It's because what he was going to have him do. You don't need to have great oratory when you're telling someone you're wrong. There's no way to say that nicely. Or else you start lying. Anybody can tell a man what he wants to hear and he'll accept it as though it's a beautiful statement. Amen. I could tell you you're beautiful. They used to see that thing all over town, written, scrawled yeah. on everything, you know, graffitied. <laughs> you are beautiful. You don't know who you're talking to. <laughs> okay, I could say that and anybody will accept it. Oh, that's so wonderful. Yes, he must be talking about me. <laughs> There's no way to smooth out a God-given message that says your mind doesn't work right. You don't have to be smooth talker for that. You just have to have the proper message from God. In shadows grass, sly whispers start. The devil's words, at the, in the devil's words, lives are torn apart. It can't be done, it's crafty tune. Defy the lie, reply. God says it's true. When God says go down there and do this, Moses is just supposed to say, yes, sir. But when we start wheel, uh, wheeling and dealing and our mind starts coming up with different scenarios and what ifs, that's where we get in trouble. You're going to follow one or the other. Now it's clear in this story. Who's he following? Well, God showed up in the burning bush. Don't you think the devil's going to be there too? Sure he is. The devil's entered his mind and says, hey, maybe God isn't quite exactly right on this one. Hmm. We can see it clearly there. 
it's probably not so easy to see it in our lives, but you just think a little bit and you'll know it. When, <laughs> the last thing you read that God said, hey, I'm talking to you, you'll do that. You'll be reading your Bible and you'll be enjoying it for a minute. And <laughs> then all of a sudden, the phrase or the words pop off the page and you say, oh, how did he know? <laughs> then it's not so fun anymore. Then the devil shows up and he says, but you could really take it this way. We could turn it so that it doesn't really hurt that bad. <laughs> Moses was comfortable where he was. God's saying, I'm going to move you from your comfort zone. And you're going to go do something you think is impossible. Because you ain't doing it, I'm doing it. The next thing I'll see in our text, in verse 12, is uh, I call this priority. Priority. He says... Verse 12. Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. That is great. God told one man, I'm going to come be your teacher. Hmm. Now I was blessed. I went to Bible school, and Dr. Ruckman was alive, and taught the class. So, I mean, he was a smart man put a lot of good things together, and so I was blessed by that. But I'll tell you one even better than that. What if God tapped you on the shoulder and said, I got something for you to do, I'm gonna come down there and teach you personally. You know what happened with uh, Paul? Jesus showed up and taught him. Pretty good deal. Here Moses is, God's telling you, I'm coming down there and I'm gonna teach you. We're gonna have class. <laughs> Verse 15. He says, I will be with thy mouth and with his mouth, Aaron, and will teach you what you shall, this is a little different, do. When God teaches, the teaching is not intended to stay in the brain. It's supposed to hit the feet. In verse 12, he's going to teach what to say. It's got to come out of your mouth. In verse 15, he's going to teach what to do. The words and the feet are supposed to match. And it's according to God, not your brain. <laughs> Otherwise, he'd have just turned him loose and said, figure it out. I trust you. No, he doesn't trust us. Psalm 25, Psalm 25, verse 12. He said, what man is he that feareth the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way that he should choose, shall choose. It starts here. If you want God to teach you, you must be humble. But it's more than humility. You better be frightened of Him. He's God Almighty. That is, if He got mad at your sins and iniquity, you would be gone. Jeremiah 32. Jeremiah 32, verse 33. It's important to have the fear of the Lord. That's one of the, the most used phrases in the Old Testament. It's in the New, too. Uh, I did it at Marcus Point. I put up a, a, on the blackboard or whiteboard or whatever it was. I put all the references to the fear of the Lord and fear of God. And it filled the board. There's that many of them. The fact is... Once you start hearing from God and being taught by God, you should still fear Him. The tendency is to think, okay, He's talking to me, I must be important. No, 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 you should still be frightened of Him. Jeremiah 32, verse 33. And they have turned unto me the back and not the face, though I taught them. We've already seen who He's going to teach. He's going to teach those that are humble and in submission to Him. He said, okay, that happened once. They were humble and in submission. I came down and started teaching them. Rising up early and teaching them, yet they have not hearkened to receive instruction. It's really scary. Once God starts talking to you, you understand this book is supernatural. You should be afraid of it, not feel like you're superior or you're on par. The fear of God is very important. He says... I'll teach you, but even some of those people I've been teaching have not been hearkening to me. They lost the fear of God. 
First Corinthians two. First Corinthians two, verse thirteen. First Corinthians two thirteen. It says, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth. Men teach. He says, which things we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. That's where we want to be taught. We want to be taught from God. That should be our priority in all of life. Meaning, whatever it is you're about to do, ask God, what am I supposed to be doing? In the simple things that other people say you're crazy, God doesn't care about that. Yes, He does. Ask Him. You'll find out. We want the Holy Spirit teaching us, not our little pea brains. <laughs> Colossians 3. Colossians 3, verse 16. Here's the way He teaches. In the previous verse, we didn't finish it, but it said comparing spiritual things with spiritual. That is using Bible and more Bible. I used to always say the answer is always Bible and more Bible. <laughs> we need to pour it in because that's how the Holy Spirit speaks. Amen. Colossians 3 verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Now here's what it'll do. Teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. You know what? It doesn't always come out as a re repetition of the scripture. Sometimes it comes out as a praise to him. But you can't praise him until you've poured enough of him in you. So put enough Bible in there and then God will use it in many different ways. Sometimes it comes out as hymns. But all of it's going to come out in praise to him. Look at 2 Peter, 2 Peter 2. 2 Peter 2, verse 1. 2 Peter 2, 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who shall privately, uh, privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. That is, be careful who's teaching. Me or anybody else. We don't want to hear what a man has to say. We want to hear what God says through the man. Mm. Now, if God, you, you'll be surprised. He'll speak to you. If you want to hear, he'll speak to you through sources you would not expect. <laughs> you just listen up and let him start talking. But when you focus on the man, God says, okay, I'll shut up. You want to hear him. Ask God to teach. When God teaches, you'll hear. But don't focus on the man because the man will lead you astray. Paul says it this way. Be ye followers of me as I follow Christ. That is, the second you see me not following Christ, don't come follow me. <laughs> follow Christ, but only, or follow me, only when you see me following Christ. So the goal is Christ, not man. 1 John 2. 1 John 2, verse 27. This is every student's life verse. When you're in high school, I don't know why they, they don't all memorize this one. But. It says, But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is true, and is no lie, even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. That is this. The Holy Spirit is your teacher. You don't need a singular man. Now you'll learn from many men. Paul says, who's Apollos and Cephas and me and all of these guys are given as teachers for you. But none of us are on the level as Christ. That's true. You have many teachers but you don't need any one singular one. That's how a cult gets started. A cult gets started as you have to worship one man. Anything he says is, you know, fact. I think God leaves a bunch of blaring errors 
in every man that gets popular so that other people can see it and say, that's not God. Amen. That's good. They say all fleas have dogs, just to remind them that they're a dog. I think that God does the very same with men. You'll find great godly men that have some things that are obviously wrong or else we would start thinking he's got it all together I gotta to follow everything he says <laughs> that's not the way it is <laughs> he says we don't need any one man but we do need the Holy Spirit and he'll teach you in conclusion I'll just give you a, a wrap up in the presence of divine might human limitations try to fight eloquence and pride hold no sway humble hearts obey not stray Trusting God's word, we boldly move. Guided by his spirit, his truth we prove. In his presence, we'll stand one day hearing, Did you argue or obey?